Hello, I'm Ted Pike. Every year, thousands of pilgrims come to this place, Palestine, to discover their spiritual roots. Yet today, it is not just the religious. Mankind in general is turning its attention toward this land. Most of us realize that if World War III erupts, it could begin right here in a collision between Arab and Jew. What are the causes of this conflict between Arab and Jew? A conflict which never seems to go away. Before Zionist settlers came here around the turn of the century, this region was not particularly known for strife. Yet since then, it has known little but strife. Is there something within Judaism itself which acts as an abrasive on this land? To answer that question, we don't need to make another pilgrimage to Palestine. We don't need to visit historic sites or Jewish shrines. Instead, since Judaism is very much a religion of its literature, we need to go where its most sacred teachings are preserved. We need to go to a synagogue, in particular, the library of a synagogue. In every synagogue library, we find hundreds of books, but there are a few which tower above the rest in authority. These include the Encyclopedia Judaica, the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the Jewish Encyclopedia, in the oldest of these, the Jewish Encyclopedia, we encounter fascinating new perspectives on the inner teachings of Judaism. Perspectives which are well known to most religious Jews, but unknown to Christians. Most Christians believe that the Judaism of the Old Testament is very similar to Judaism today. Yet the Jewish Encyclopedia, in its article on Judaism, says modern Judaism and the Judaism of the Old Testament are very different. It says that after Nebuchadnezzar conquered Judah in the 6th century B.C. and led the Jews to distant Babylon, the Jews were faced with challenges to their faith they had never before experienced. Ever since the time of Solomon, the religion of Israel had centered around the magnificent temple in Jerusalem with its sacrifices and rituals. The question now became, how could one be a true Jew in a very foreign, even hostile environment? The need arose for a certain class of lay priests, called scribes or sophura, to interpret the law in this new setting and make it workable. In time, these scribes became what the New Testament calls the scribes and Pharisees, the greatest legal authorities of Israel for all ages. The Pharisees said there were really two inspired revelations to the Jews. There was the written law of Moses received atop Sinai, but there was also the oral tradition acquired by 70 elders who came to the base of the mountain but were forbidden to proceed farther. The Pharisees said that these 70 elders, or Sanhedrin, received a much more extensive and profound revelation than Moses, a revelation which was never written down, yet took precedent over the written law. When Jesus came on the scene, his reaction was to bitterly denounce this counterfeit tradition. Christ said the Pharisees, by their tradition, had made the law of God of none effect. He considered the Pharisees the most dangerous leadership Israel ever had. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Although Jewish sects such as the Sadducees now disappeared, the Pharisees emerged with even greater power over the Jewish people. The Jewish Encyclopedia describes the new role of the Pharisees. With the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees disappeared altogether, leaving the regulation of all Jewish affairs in the hands of the Pharisees. Henceforth, Jewish life was regulated by the Pharisees. The whole history of Judaism was reconstructed from the Pharisaic point of view. Pharisaism shaped the character of Judaism and the life and thought of the Jew for all of the future. In 135 AD, all Jews were expelled from Palestine. The Pharisees led most Palestinian Jews in a mass migration back to Babylon. The majority of Jews were already in Babylon and had been since the time of Nebuchadnezzar 600 years earlier. Yet around 140 AD, Babylon became the acknowledged land of refuge for world Jewry. For another thousand years, Judaism flourished in Babylon under the leadership of the Pharisees. Great academies of the rabbis were established and thousands of new laws formulated. There, those same Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ 
remained the undisputed rulers of Judaism. In Babylon, the Pharisees codified their oral traditions into the Babylonian Talmud, the written form of that oral tradition which Jesus so bitterly rebuked. The Talmud reveals how deep was Israel's apostasy. In her beginning, God gave the Hebrews the loftiest, the most upright literature and ethics the world has ever known. Yet when they turned their backs on him, they produced the Talmud, a work which has aptly been called a monument to human folly. The Talmud also helps us understand the basis for Christ's unflattering descriptions of the Pharisees. Jesus described the Pharisees as hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He even described the Pharisees as children of their father the devil, a murderer from the beginning. The Talmud confirms Christ's words. In the Talmud, in Treatise Sanhedrin, an extensive passage describes the right of the Pharisee to kill anyone, just as long as he did so indirectly. As one of dozens of examples, the Talmud tells us that if one bound his neighbor and he died of starvation, he is not liable to execution. In such an indirect manner, the Pharisees also killed Christ. Manipulating the Romans to actually wield the spear and sword, the Pharisees claimed, as their descendants do today, that since the Romans were the direct cause of the death of Christ, it is the Romans, not the Jews, who are guilty. Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, A proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbi said, When a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. Or when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots, too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ. Yet it's critical, even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. 
If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, a rabbi may quickly object, saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish Encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject, giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish Encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. Since the Talmud outlawed the child, or issue of a Gentile, as that of a beast, a Gentile had as little legal rights in a Jewish court as did an animal. The Talmud states that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, the Israelite. Conversely, if the Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages. Because the Talmud conspires against Gentiles, if a Jew was ever caught telling a Gentile what the Talmud really says, such a person deserves death. So vile was the nature of a Gentile that the great Simeon ben Yohai said, the best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Jews, however, are exalted beings in the Talmud, worthy of praise. Christ described the Pharisee who blessed himself, saying, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as other men. An eminent Talmudic rabbi says the same. Blessed be thou who hast not made me a goy or Gentile. There is a special antagonism between the Talmud and Jesus. The Talmud attacks him everywhere it can, even his mother. Mary, the Talmud says, was a whore who mated with carpenters. She who was the descendant of princes and governors played the harlot with carpenters. It naturally followed that the scribes declared Christ to be a bastard. In its article on Jesus, the Jewish Encyclopedia says that Jewish writings defame Christ. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. Jesus, according to this article, was considered one of the three worst enemies of Judaism who came to an ignoble end. The Talmud says they subjected him to four deaths, stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangling. The Talmud also says he is now in hell, punished with boiling hot excrement. What is Christ's advice as he speaks to us out of hell? The Jewish Encyclopedia quotes Jesus as telling us above all to bless the Jews. He says, Further their well-being. Do nothing to their detriment. Whoever touches them touches even the apple of his eye. Christians, as followers of the false prophet Jesus, also deserve death. The Jewish Encyclopedia again recaps the Talmud's position. A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. It says the Talmud's hatred was probably directed against the Christian Jews. These Judeo-Christians, evasively called Min, Minit, or Minim, were considered by the rabbis to be the most dangerous form of heretics of ancient times. The New Testament Gospels were writings which the rabbis considered more dangerous to the unity of Judaism than those of the pagans. A Talmudic rabbi said, the writings of Christians deserve to be burned for paganism is less dangerous than minute or Christianity. The Jewish Encyclopedia in its article on men continues to illustrate the Talmudic hatred of Christianity. Again, we must remember, Minim usually indicates the Judeo-Christians. It was forbidden to partake of meat, bread, or wine with the Christian. 
Scrolls of the Law, Tefillin, and Mezuzot written by a Christian were burned. An animal slaughtered by a Christian was forbidden food. The relatives of the Christian were not permitted to observe the laws of mourning after his death, but were required to assume festive garments and rejoice. The testimony of a Christian was not admitted in evidence in Jewish courts, and an Israelite who found anything belonging to one who was a Christian was forbidden to return it to him. The Pharisees, through their Talmud, thus gave the Jews an ethic which encouraged bigotry and isolation. But it did worse than that. It invited persecution. By the 11th century, the inhabitants of Babylon, growing weary of the self-righteousness and dishonesty of the Jews, expelled them to the West. Migrating as North Africa and Central Europe, the great majority of Jews who had lived in Babylon for almost 1,600 years now began to find their destinies in the cities of the West. Yet in coming to the West, Jews found their Christian neighbors extremely intolerant of the antisocial deviations Jews had taken for granted in Babylon. In order to survive, it was necessary to abandon such Babylonian traditions. But that was not as easy as it sounds. For a thousand years, the Pharisees had commanded such deviations. Most Jews could not bring themselves to defy the authority of the Pharisees. Enter one of the giants of Judaism of all time, the great Maimonides. Maimonides, a physician and philosopher, knew that no Jew who practiced Babylonian perversions could remain alive in Christian lands. He attempted to harmonize Greek philosophy with the best points of Judaism. He hoped his rationalizations would enable Jews to abandon their antisocial customs. Yet Maimonides was only partly successful. He was excommunicated by the Jewish community on the charge of making new laws. Nevertheless, his moderation and intellect did in fact temper the old Judaism of Babylon. Gradually over the centuries, Jews abandoned immoral practices of the Talmud. Such practices are not observed today. In fact, most Jews are so ignorant of the Talmud itself that they do not even know that such teachings exist within their sacred literature. Yet the fact remains that when the Jews came to the West in the Middle Ages and attempted to accommodate the Talmud to Christian society, a tremendous conflict was created. In Babylon, Judaism could be perfectly consistent with the teachings of the Pharisees because the Babylonians were immoral as well. In Christian lands of the West, it became necessary to pretend that many of those teachings did not exist. Even today, religious Jews continue to venerate the Pharisees and their Talmud as the greatest source of light that Judaism will ever know. Yet living in Christian lands, no Jew can fully perform what the Pharisees commanded. This conflict in Jewish responsibility has created a dilemma over the last thousand years from which Jews in the West have not emerged.